Welcome back to New York Close Up. Joining us now is Eddie Frierson, the writer and star of Maddie, An Evening with Christy Mathewson. It's now playing at the Lambs Theater on West 44th Street. The Polo Grounds of 1908, considered hallow ground to giant fans during the first decade of the 20th century. Christy Mathewson, master pitcher of the New York Giants, helped give it its luster. And now Eddie Frierson as Christy Mathewson. Good evening. I'm Christy Mathewson. I was born in a small town, Factoryville, Pennsylvania, the eldest of six children, and named after my uncle, Christopher Mathewson, back on August 12th, 1880, and therefore am somewhat old for a baseball player. An alibi is sound and needed in all competitions because the basic foundation for success is having confidence in yourself. You can never afford to admit that any opponent is better than you are. So if you lose to someone or something, there must be a reason, a bad break. You must have an alibi to know why you lost. And if you haven't a reason, you must create one because your self-confidence must always be maintained. Therefore, I always said, Always, always have an alibi, but here's the important part. Always, always keep it to yourself because that's where your alibi belongs. Lose graciously out in the open, but to yourself, lose bitterly and learn from it. You can learn very little from a victory, but you can learn everything from defeat. And now, Eddie Frierson as himself. Welcome and thanks for joining us. It's good to be here. You grew up in Nashville. You went to UCLA to play baseball and to study theater. How did that all evolve into writing and performing in Maddie? Well, when I was playing ball at UCLA, I was playing with some great ball players: Tim Leary, Mike Gallego, Don Slott, a lot, I mean, a lot of fellows who, who went on to the big leagues, and I was not their caliber. And it appeared very clear to me uh, at the end of my sophomore year that I wasn't going to make the big leagues, even though I had a couple of offers. Um, and so I decided that uh, what I was going to do is, uh, is really go after what I wanted to do, which was the acting thing. And I got my degree in theater arts. And then when I graduated uh, UCLA, before the huge glut of one-person shows years ago, I was uh, looking for a subject to, uh, to turn into a theatrical piece. And my father came across a copy of Pitching in a Pinch, a book that Matthewson wrote in 1912 that he found in a used bookstore somewhere, which today would be worth a gazillion dollars, but he got it for next to nothing. And um, I took that book with me on vacation to go to a family reunion, and the, it, the characters just jumped off the page to me, and I said, this is it, this is the guy. He's my size, thinks the way I do. These Looks characters like are wonderful. Well, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, so that's really what, uh, what started it, and then uh, my father suggested that I go on a, on a trip up to Factoryville, Pennsylvania, find it on the map, see if there's anyone there still alive, and, and so I did, and uh, that was 12 years ago, that first trip, and all along the journey, it's uh, been nothing but a nonstop uh, series of meeting wonderful people and having great experiences, and, and uh, I couldn't be more thrilled that I've been uh, accepted into the Matthewson family, and really, uh, you know, th those relationships I, I value even more than the success of the show. It's it's really been a wonderful journey for me. You're even wearing a, a shirt from his old town, right? Keystone uh, Academy, where he went to grammar school, uh, was the class of 1898 before he went to Bucknell University. Uh, is now a college, a full-fledged four-year college in Factoryville, um, and uh, so I was just there before coming into New York on Matthewson's birthday weekend in August, and we had a big uh, uh, weekend of two performances and a big parade, Christy Matthewson Day from, from downtown Factoryville to Keystone, and the whole town turned out in great numbers, and we had a wonderful time, and they gave me the shirt. Great. <laughs> Eddie, uh, Maddie got a very nice review in the New York Times recently, uh, and it described Christy Matthewson as uh, almost an anachronism, the days of baseball's innocence. Was he really all that innocent? How would he fare today if he were playing baseball? He would do well. He would be uh, considered a, a, an Oral Hershiser type as mm -hmm. far as personality goes and what have you. Um, but uh, the grandest of all the players uh, would have been universally loved like a Nolan Ryan. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what town you go in, people are going to pull for you pretty much. Uh, and. Uh, 
He, at the time he came in the big league in 1900, prior to that in the 1890s and, and before that, pretty much the reason to go to a ball game was to place a bet. Mm -hmm. So only the men went to the ballpark and it was only to make some side bets and to have some fun and, and be a little bit rough and spit and cuss and throw a glass beer mug at the umpire and whatever you did. But um, when the American League was formed in 1901, uh, Ban Johnson, who formed the American League, was trying to turn it in, into a family league where none of the players were allowed to argue with umpires and, and whatever. And the National League countered with that with this college boy who had just come into New York uh, who refused to play ball on Sundays because of a promise he made to his mother. And so they used Matthewson, him being the biggest name in New York, and New York, of course, being the biggest market then and now, mm -hmm. uh, they used him to make baseball the vehicle, uh, the, used him as the vehicle to make baseball the national pastime. Most people may not remember uh, him or even his record. After all, the New York Giants left town some time ago. He stopped playing, uh, stopped pitching at least in 1916. What was his record? He won 373 games in his career, and uh, really 374, but they took one away 88 years ago yesterday, or two days ago, uh, on Fred Merkel Day, September 23rd. And um, uh, he was just, he was an amazing pitcher. His, his, his idea of throwing a ball game was let's get out of here in an hour. So he threw strikes, wanted people to hit them, you know, fielding the ball behind him. Mm -hmm. And if he got in trouble, or the pinch, as he called it, then he would pitch in the pinch. But other than that, he just wanted to throw and get out of there and go home to his wife and his son. How would he fare today as a pitcher? Wonderful. Uh, he had tremendous speed, uh, although when he was younger, he threw a lot harder. But he realized that that was pretty stupid because after the 1901 season, he played on the last, last place Giants team and threw as hard as he could all year. And he had his arm in a sling for six weeks after the season was over. So he decided, it's really silly. I really only have to rev it up when I need to. And uh, so he became a thinking pitcher. And he had a photographic memory. Of course, they didn't call it that then. But um, he remembered everything about hitters and really about anything in life. He was the world's checkers champion. He once, at one time, uh, blindfolded himself and played 13 people simultaneously, going from table to table. And he got he won seven matches and six draws, blindfolded. Remarkable. Which is so. He just remembered everything and used, the, used his brain talents to uh, translate onto the baseball field, and he was able to throw the ball wherever he wanted. He was just one of those exce exceptional talents and personalities in the game. Now, I remember reading in the review that uh, one of the things you do in Maddie, the show, is reenact uh, part of the 1908 playoffs between the Giants and the Chicago Cubs, playoffs that uh, resulted in a riot at the polo grounds. How come? Well, it was the first ever postseason playoff for the the league championship. Uh, what happened on September 23rd, 1908, uh, there were two outs and runners at first and third, and Al Bridwell got a base hit to the outfield that rolled all the way to the wall. And Fred Merkel, a rookie who was on first base at the time, ran straight from first base to the clubhouse in center field without going to second base. And uh, Johnny Evers of the Chicago Cubs screamed and yelled and got the umpires to come back out and said he never went to second base. It's a force out. The rule's in the book. I told you two weeks ago it was in the book and you didn't uh, uphold it then because uh, it's really kind of, it's, it's a long convoluted story to he get to it. was the Marvin Thronberry of his day. Well, actually, no. Uh, Fred Merkel was one of the smarter players. The thing was, up until that day, when there were two outs in the bottom half of the ninth inning, if there was a base hit, mm -hmm. the game was over. Nobody went to the next base. Nobody crossed home plate. Nobody had to run to first base. The rule where, you know, if there's, if there's a force out, no runs can score on that play was never enforced huh. in, the, in the bottom of the ninth. But that day, they, you know, they convinced the umpires, yes, it is in the rule book. No, there isn't an exclusion for it. And they said, he's out. The game is a tie suspended due to darkness. And the league... Uh, upheld that decision and forced when the Giants and the Cubs ended the season in a tie for first place the Giants had an option of a best of three or a one game playoff and they opted for the one game playoff since half the club was really hurt pretty badly mm -hmm. at the time and uh, Matthewson pitched that day and didn't fare very well and they lost the, lost the playoff and the pennant and in, uh, the Chicago Cubs went on to win the World Series and uh, you'll find out more about that but there's a reason why they haven't won since.